Welcome back to the Early Way In Podcast. Here for one of the best pay-per-views of the year, man. UFC 299 going down in Miami, Florida on this Saturday. 14 total fights for us to get into. Uh, main event, Bantamweight strap between Sean O'Malley uh, and Marlon Chito Vera. A rematch there that ended in the first round. Some bad blood. And, man, it almost doesn't get better uh, than our co-main event between Dustin Poirier and Benoit St. Denis. Not for a title, but should be an epic uh, epic fight, man. Scheduled for five rounds as well, which I did not know until this week. Can't wait to get into it. Without further ado, let you recap uh, one of the worst nights in podcast history. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely terrible night, but uh, it is part of the game, you know. Um, let's see. We take a look over at your card. We both took the stab on Shamil Gaziev. There was a lot of red flags coming into this one. Uh, we understood it. He did get the fight to the mat. Um, I thought that he'd do a little bit more with it, and I thought that it'd be a little bit more consistent. But uh, it was a huge step up, paid the price for it. We got in on a good number, so right. moral victory there, right? Something. Um, <laughs> See, you had a couple parlays. Uh, one of them hit. You had Nurmagomedov, Duncan, and Petrino. All those looked like good plays. Um, and the other one was ruined, like many of the other people who were betting on this juiced card uh, with Basher at to win over Eamon Zahabi. Mm-hmm. Zahabi doing as usual, uh, yeah. you know, best Neil Magny impression, making the fight mm-hmm. weird, keeping it standing and, and landing enough shots to get the nod on the judges' scorecard. Um, you had the fight doesn't go the distance in Nurmagomedov, Al Makan, and, uh, you know, taking the fight on that short notice, pretty good effort from Al Makan. You know, Nurmagomedov finishes most people in that spot, and uh, props to him for making it past that. Uh, get to the judges' scorecard. Um, you had some unders in the Pedro Petrino fight. I don't think anybody really saw that one coming. And, uh, yeah, same thing with the Shamil Gaziev rosenstroke We also thought that that was going to be a quick fight. Um, then we were so close opening opening fight on the card. We both had Loic Rods above Al Sawadi over two and a half rounds, um, about a minute away from hitting that. Right. Yeah. Uh, ended up the night minus 6.2 units. Uh, definitely a tough one, but I'm going to bounce back right here. Plenty of good money spots on the card. Looking at my my card, like I said, we were both on the Shamil Gaziev bet. Uh, I took a big plus 850 stab on Bexat mm-hmm. Al- Almakan. Um, he fought for my money, clipped him in that yep. first round, made me jump out of my seat, but uh, couldn't get it mm-hmm. done. I tried to hedge it with Nurmagomedov by submission, and turns out Bexat's super tough, so uh you know, kind of paid the price trying to hedge my own reads there. Um, that That's always one, a tough pill to swallow. Um, I talked about the over two and a half missing in the opening fight with Rod Zabav Al Salwadi. That was the other big parlay that I had. Um, but I did end up playing Loic Rod Zabav straight, uh, plus mm-hmm. 138 for one and a half units. Um, only play on my card that hit. So I, you know, got to highlight that one for sure. Um, and then a couple of stabs. Uh, I got to talk about the soap high by submission over Vinicius Oliveira plus 1400. And that would have changed my card completely. Uh, yeah. Definitely a tough one when he has him flattened out a few times um, is what it is. But uh, soap high or probably, I don't know, knockout of the year That's candidate for sure. Right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I ended up minus 4.74 units and yeah, definitely a night that the podcast would like to forget. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I think we got some good spots coming up, uh, with our first fight on the card being a rematch itself in the women's flyweight division, Joanne called, well, Joanne Wood taking on Myrna Moroz and, uh, in their first fight, uh, Moroz was able to get an arm bar, uh, you know, WMMA all over it. And all right. <laughs> first round arm bar. It, it's, uh, bound to happen a few times. Whenever two low-level girls are, are squaring off in the cage, uh, for this one, I think that they both matured since their their last meeting. Um, right now, I think that it's tough to gauge how good Morose is. It seems to me like she hasn't really beaten anybody um, that good. Whereas mm-hmm. we've seen Joanne Calderwood in the past make it close with some really good high-level competition. Um, that being said, she JoJo is 38 years old. Not really sure um, where she's at in her in her career. She's only lost to the upper echelon of the division. Um, 
with her last fight being a split decision win over a, a decent competitor in Luana Carolina. Um, certainly a big girl. Um, I, I don't know, man. I, I think that this is a plus three and a half spot for Joanne Wood. Um, if she's going to be like a plus 200 dog, maybe we can get the plus three and a half at like minus 120. And I think that that's an okay price to pay in a fight that even though it finished last time, I'm, I'm fairly certain that this is going over. And I don't even think that there's a good over price tag on it. I think it's like minus 300 for the over two and a half. So um, the plus three and a half on Joanne Wood, who is notorious for making fights close, I think is a, is a solid look. Hey, I don't hate it. Um, I think it does go over as well. Um, I do think Marina Moroz is the one that gets her hand raised here. Um, I actually think she's an underrated fighter, man, truth be told. I think she's a pretty good, you know, got pretty good boxing, pretty good striking. Um, she doesn't go to it as much as she should, but I actually think she's got pretty decent grappling, man. Um, comes from a good camp down at ATT. My one knock on her is the, you know, the modeling, the Playboy stuff, you know, what's her training situation seriously like these days with the money coming elsewhere and stuff. Uh, but but I, I really do think she matches and, and can beat JoJo in most areas of the fight here. You, thought, you talked about it, almost 40 years old, super inactive. Um, I saw some talk online, potentially maybe this being her retirement fight. I've already kind of questioned the motivation after she took that Jennifer Maya, you know, fight and then lost it you know, pretty much pissing away her title shot kind of seems like the, the career trajectories kind of went downhill since then. I think the finish upsides on Marina Moreau's um, probably by submission would be the only way I think she gets it done again. I, I just feel like her takedown upside in this fight is, is what's going to win her. And that's what kind of makes me a little bit worried about the three and a half. Cause I do feel like she could, she could clearly win rounds with her grappling here. So it's going to be a pass for me. Um, although I do expect the fight to go a lot later than last time. I'm on the Moreau's side by decision. Move on to the men's flyweight division. CJ Vergara taking on Asu Amabayev. Um, you know, when I was looking at this, line probably influenced a lot by the fact that CJ Vergara's lost to Ode. Asu just went out there and, you know, made quick work of Ode Osborne. But, man, watching tape on Asu, watching tape on CJ Vergara, I think this is a really good fight for Asu Amabayev. And I really like backing this guy. He's a style of fighter that I really like to back as well. Got really good wrestling. Um, in that Ode fight, showed a good single leg, man. Showed a good inside trip. When he got on top, he was active. Ground and pound. He was passing guard. End of round one, the guy pulls a Peruvian necktie. Round two, finds the rear naked choke. Um, he doesn't just get on top and stall. He's very, very active with it. Um, even on the feet, good calf kick, good right hand. And I thought that Ode presented a, you know, a much bigger problem than CJ Vergara did here. I feel like Ode is a lot lengthier, more athletic guys, faster, better on the feet. And, you know, we've seen Ode submit guys from bottom before as well, but I just don't think there's too much to worry about for CJ Vergara off the bottom here. I, I do feel like Asu is going to ground him, um, land plenty of takedowns here, maybe even get the submission. CJ Vergara has been submitted twice, I believe, uh, but he's a pretty tough guy, man. And he's just not a guy that I typically like backing because he's typically a guy that gives up rounds early, um, tries to fight from behind, and I don't like his takedown defense, which I think Asu is a very good wrestler, man. So I think the chalk is warranted here. I like Asu to uh, to maybe get another submission, man, or at least a very dominant 30-27. Uh, a little bit of technical difference. Difficulties there. Uh, I think we left off on the CJ Vergara versus Asu Al Alma Bea fight. Um, you know, I think the line is a little bit out of proportion. Um, CJ Vergara, he gets a bad rap. There's a lot of um, like highlight clip of him running around the mm -hmm. octagon whenever he was hurt. And while it looks awful, I like the fact that he can kind of you know, I, I don't know, do what it takes to survive. I look at the two losses that are on his record. Both guys and Ode Osborne and Tatsuro Tyra missed weight in those fights. So he's, you know, he's already at a disadvantage coming into those. No, um, no, not to Vergara mention, missed weight in both of those fights. Oh, shit. Damn, dude. Okay. Was, <laughs> <laughs> damn. All right. Well, Kind of the same thing. Okay, he wasn't ready for those fights coming into it, you know? Somebody was off weight, so something's a little funky in that one. Um, but even in his wins, you know, the Clinton Rodriguez split decision win, um, I just feel like, I don't know, I feel like the line's a little bit out of proportion. We saw Asu 
go to split decision with some guy who has double digit losses on his record, Mm -hmm. super old. Um, I feel like he's, he's one dimensional in the fact that if he can't get this to the ground, I haven't seen much to explain a minus 600 when we've kind of only seen him work one path to victory. Uh, so that's why I think the line's a little bit out of proportion. That being said, I do think that he's the rightful favorite here and should get the job done against CJ Vergara. Uh, moving on to, you know, one of the more exciting de- debutants of the year, I feel like. Yeah. Robelis Despain taking on Josh Parisian in the heavyweight divi- division. Uh, Despain, he's now broken the record for the longest reach mm-hmm. uh, previously held by my boy and uh, – who else? Stefan Struve at 84 and a half inches. And um, I think his is 80. It was 87 coming into this. And then I think the UFC measured him and now it's 86 inch reach, um, which is still extremely impressive, dude. He's only four and oh, a collective 19 seconds of fight tape in his past three fights. Yeah. Um, it's hard. It's hard to really cap him. I, I actually placed a bet on him at minus 250. Uh, whenever the line initially dropped and uh, I've got about a hundred points on it, but I'm, I'm just as soon to cash out of that bet, man, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. I do feel like I'm, you know, everybody's taking a stab. Obviously this is a fighter who, who that the UFC is trying to bring in and highlight giving him a opponent like Josh Parisian. Um, Robelis is going to be much, much bigger, much faster, uh, much more of a power puncher, um, but definitely unproven. And even though Josh Parisian hasn't proven much in the UFC octagon, he does have um, some some experience with some decent level of competition, um, a couple of wins against lower level guys in the division. Um, you know, if this come down to, to MMA, I think that Josh Parisian has a decent chance. I'm just not sure that he has the the level of wrestling to get this fight where it needs to happen. And um, I expect him closing the distance to get caught relatively early and mm-hmm. Robelis to Spain to be put on display um, for the UFC. I, I imagine the UFC gives him a pretty favorable uh, ladder up the, uh, the UFC rankings. Yeah, man, I'm with you. It's, I want to take a dog shot on Josh Parisian. Like I just, Solely off the basis of we got a guy who's a 4 0 Taekwondo heavyweight. You know, we give Henry Cejudo a little bit of shit for his flyweight or his like 115 pound medal in the Olympics or something. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Truly, how many heavyweight Taekwondo guys are there? I don't, you know, I don't know if the there's a ton of people that he's necessarily fault. Um, but like you Certainly said, none that look like him, right? Exactly, right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, athletic specimen, man, uh, like six foot seven, isn't it? But uh, yeah, 19 mm-hmm. seconds of fight time all last year combined. Um, his first pro fight, um, he stalled on the cage for a little bit of time, and all four of his opponents combined have one one fight, you know. So it, it, unproven was the correct word for this guy, but it does seem like he's he's probably going to catch Josh Parisian early. Um, truth be told, I really would like to see. Just, just slap a fat number on Josh Parisian live if this if this starts going south. If he finds his way on top, and that conti- I think it was the Contender Series fight it is, that he, fi- he finds his way on top and finishes it with ground and pound. He's a big dude, you know? So, I mean, if he gets on top of Robellis, I don't know if Robellis is getting him off of him, just truth be told. So, um, I'm not really cheering for Josh Parisian, but I think it'd be pretty comical if he were to come in here and upset this, this massive debutante. Moving not on willing to, to take the shot, though, right? Yeah, definitely not willing to take the shot, man. Uh, not on Parisian. Not to guys who are losing to Roki Martinez and stuff like that. Uh, Philippe Lenz and Ion Kutalaba at 205. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure they've been matched up before. Pretty solid matchmaking here. I do want to do a little bit more tape, I guess, on this fight. I don't have the clearest read here. I feel like Philippe Lenz um, probably has the advantage on the feet here. Most people have the gas tank advantage on Kutalaba. Since coming down from heavyweight, the guy looks very, very strong, can put you on the fence, pretty decent grappler. Um, but I'm kind of worried about his durability. Uh, just truth be told, I think Kutilaba is pretty fast, hits really hard. He gets on the inside early. I think I think he could end the fight. Um, he's a very good offensive threat, Kutilaba is, but you know, notorious for slowing down late in fights. Doesn't have fight, good fight IQ, leaves his neck out. I, I think it's Kute Lava one or probably Philippe Lenz in two or three. So I think I do think this fight uh, has a finish, 
just just not really that confident on what side it comes from. Um, but I do think Kutelaba is very dangerous in round one, so I'm going to side with Kutelaba. Yeah, I'd have to agree, man. You know, uh, for the exact reasons that you talked about, you look at the five losses on Lenz's record and four out of the five of them come in round one or early round two. And um, that's, you know, exactly the game plan of Kutelaba. Kutelaba starts extremely fast and he's been known to blow, blow his gas tank. Um, but I look at the three fight win streak that Felipe Lenz is on, and it's you know it's nothing to write home about. The Prakniao win, uh, aging OSP, and then Maxim Grishin, who you know just didn't show up for that fight, in my opinion. Uh, Kute Laba seems like the type of guy, he's still only 30 years old, he has all this experience, and I think that he could probably put together a decent game plan for this. Um, with that initial start, though, like I I really like his odds with somebody like Lynn, who I don't really see as um, the highest level finisher, to be honest yeah. with you. We haven't really seen it in the UFC. And so it's tough to, to say it, you know, knocking out OSP at this point in his career, it doesn't say much. So right. uh, for me, I think I'm with you on the Kutilaba pick. Uh, not a lot of conviction on that though. Uh, moving down to the, Middleweight division, Michelle Pereira taking on Mikhail Olegzhechek. Um, I have to agree with the odds makers here, man. You know, Michelle Pereira, I think that he's a little faster, mm-hmm. a little more athletic, and, um, you know, just at a better point in his career. I think that Olegzhechek has proven time and time again that if you don't have 15 minutes of cardio to – keep him on the end of your punches. He is going to continue to come forward, push a pace that a lot of people can't keep up with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since uh, Pereira has kind of slowed down his game, really started mixing in some uh, patience, some, some MMA. um, I think that it's all been positive since he's gotten into the UFC being a little bit more cerebral when he's fighting, not wasting energy. And, um, this is an excellent test to see where he's at. Um, but I do think that for 15 minutes, he probably has what it takes to edge out um, Oleg Jacek here. I expect him to at least bank two rounds, and then it might be a, a tight third round. But I, I do give it to Pereira, and I expect a decision probably. Pretty much exactly what I'm going to say, man. I think this line's pretty damn accurate. I have also got Michelle Pereira winning decision here. Um, one thing I want to that I noted, I'm very happy to see both of these guys finally at 185, where they truly should have been all along. You know, Michelle was Gatler literally killing himself to make 170, and Mikhail Olazacek was a very very small light heavyweight. I think mm-hmm. they both are going to find um, a lot of their success in this 185 uh, pound division. When I watch tape on this, I just feel like Pereira has so many more paths to victory, man. You know, he kind of talked on his cardio advantage and and kind of how I feel like the stupid mistakes are behind him. The bad fight IQ that he showed early, dancing to the octagon, doing backflips. Like, he's, he's taking a career more serious. He's, he knows he can compete with these guys, man. Um, I feel like he has big grappling upside, truth be told. He's a far wider, uh, far wide range of, like, strikes. This guy will can dominate in the kicking game, you know. Um, Michelle is, like, pretty much boxing only. And if this fight goes to decision, I, I do favor Michelle Perea heavily. I actually think that it's round one that could be a little hairy. Mikhail is somebody that comes off the gates hot, um, comes out. A lot of his finishes are in round one. He's got really good pressure boxing. He does work the body. Um, and when you watch that GD fight, man, he's a he's a dog. And that's, that's kind of what makes me a little bit scared to bet against him because I, I don't know if Michelle Perea is going to finish this guy and I do see some finishing upside on the dog early, and typically that is enough to kind of to kind of keep me off. As well as I said, I think the line's pretty accurate. I don't know how much you know meat there is left on the bone on the Michelle Pereira. I, I cap him a minus about a minus one fifty. So um, I just think it's accurate. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to force a play here, but he is going to be the person I side with. Official pick for Saturday. Moving what down. about the over one and a half at minus 185? Hmm. I think it goes to decision. I do so, too. Yeah, that might honestly might be a, a play that I look at I look at as well, man. Um, Obviously, you know plus money on the goes to decision too, plus 160, plus 170. So another spot That's we might look at. 
And I uh, moving down the bantamweight division, a fight that I uh, I think I am trying to target some type of over goes the distance in a parlay or something here. Pedro Munoz versus Kyler Phillips. Um, I think Kyler Phillips might do enough to get his hand raised. I feel like he's going to throw a bit more volume out there. He's going to have the flashier strikes. I think the bigger octagon will favor Kyler Phillips on Saturday. Um, but dude, you just, you can't lay a price tag on this, um, on Kyler Phillips. The guy fails to cover his price tag essentially every single time. Um, he's very fast. He's very explosive, but he slows down in fights. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I was looking through some of his fights and he's lost round three on majority of his UFC fights. And so that's what kind of leads me to kind of want to look at the Pedro Munoz plus three and a half, because I think shit, he, he has a good chance of winning round three on every judge's scorecard. Maybe just another one. He's a, he's a vet man. Um, he's durable as can be. He's never fit, been finished before. He's got an incredible gas tank, a good calf kick that I think could maybe, you know, make Kyler a little bit more stationary if he can get to him. Because I think he's going to struggle to find his hands on Kyler, who does use range uh, very well. Who, like I said, is a younger, a little bit more athletic guy. So I think Pedro will have to rely on the kicks to kind of slow him down. But ultimately, man, I, I I know it's juice, but neither one of these guys have ever been finished. Pedro approaching 30 fights and never being finished. Kyler Phillips, not I don't even know if he's got a UFC finish. Don't quote me on that. I have to go look at it. But he doesn't strike me as the most dangerous guy either. So I think this fight honestly goes to decision at 80% of the time. I think you could have goes the distance at minus 400 and we're going to get it about minus two, 225, somewhere around that. So I do think there's some value on that at the end of the day. And I'm going to go Kyler Phillips by split decision. Um, yeah. So this is a, a weird one for me. I see a lot of people that, you know, a tweet that's going viral on MMA Twitter is the draw on this fight. Um, people, a lot of people like the 10, eight in round one and then two rounds for Pedro Munoz after that. Okay. Um, I definitely see that happening, but that's also the only reason why I'm off of Pedro Munoz. You know, I, I agree with the fact that he can, um, you know, him having never been, been finished, um, having the better gas tank and, and having the more experience, those are all positives and something that makes me want to play him. But the fact that, you know, there is a, a decent possibility that he has to endure a 10-8 um, mm-hmm. is, is enough to, to not bet him, man. You know, I think that that's just a, a losing play um, long term whenever you're looking at it pre-fight. You know, I think that there's a live spot opportunity for Pedro Munoz, but to bet him, um, you know, pre-fight, it's just uh, it's not appealing to me, man. Uh, might have a change of heart later on in the week, but that's currently how I sit with it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I'm going to go with <laughs> I think I'm going to go with Kyler Phillips here strictly because I do think he has the finishing upside of the two, um, especially early. So that's that's something I can't ignore. Um, and I, I feel like at their point in their career that Kyler Phillips is probably um, at a more prime part of his career so no you saw that anymore for him either <laughs> yeah maybe he's maybe he'll turn back to what he was you know yeah, maybe he's got third round gas tank absolutely um uh, moving up to the lightweight division Mateusz Gamrot versus Rafael Dos Anjos um I feel like this is the true like start of the meat of the card dude you know this is where you get some of the killer killer yeah. fights that this fight card has to offer um both these guys Top level guys in the division, Mateusz Gamrot. I think he's ranked um, fifth right now. Tapology has fifth, but I don't know if that's technically right. I think I think he's top ten, but I don't know if he's number five. Okay, because um, in my head, this seems like quite the opportunity for Rafael dos Anjos coming off of a loss to Vicente Luque. You know, he's thirty nine years old at this point. He's cutting down to lightweight for the first time in like a year and a half. Almost two um, years. Yeah, 20, I think 20 months. Um, it's, I don't know, dude. There's a, a lot of unknowns here. I'm curious to see how he looks getting on the scale. Um, Gamrot with his, you know, persistent uh, takedown attempts, a good jab. I think that he offers a lot of what 
Rafael Dos Anjos had difficulty defending in the past, you know, like this is kind of, <laughs> kind of the, the blue, the, the exact blueprint um, in a prime version in Mateusz Gamrot for what RDA has kind of suffered from in the past. And I, I feel like he's probably going to grind out a decision like Mateusz Gamrot does, you know, not the, uh, not the most exciting fighter by any means, but I think he'll get it done. Yeah, me too, man. I think um, I think the UFC is actually doing Gamrod a favor here. I, I feel like a lot of the top of the lightweight divisions matched up. You've got you know you got Michael Chandler waiting on Conor McGregor. You got Islam as the champ. You've got you got uh, what Dustin and BSD. You've got Gaethje fighting Max Holloway, um, Armin and Charles. So it's like you know Gamrod was needing a fight, and I, I I think the UFC gave him a very stylistically great fight for him, and also a big name um, for his resume. Yeah, a guy who, in my opinion, is in the absolute prime of his career right now, with who's already got 25 fights, man. Um, I think he's very experienced. I think Gamron's a very good fighter, and it's without a doubt the tail end of Rafael Dos Anjos' career. I think 155 um, is a big talking point on this career or on this fight. Um, at this stage of his career, I think RDA, not that he's going to struggle on the scale because the dude's a professional. Um, I think he's going to make 155. It's how much gas does he have at 155 late in this fight with the pace that this fight's going to be fought at. I think stylistically, like you talked about, Gamron has exactly what RDA has historically struggled with. I um I actually kind of compare Gamrot to like a lightweight Colby Covington, man. It's not the best control style, but this guy will go out there and shoot 20 plus takedowns a fight um, and has ridiculous pace and cardio to him. I, I think he grounds Rafael de Sanjos six to 10 times here and wins a pretty comfortable unanimous decision. I, I, I see the, I see the striking advantage, the experience, things like that that Rafael de Sanjos has, but at this stage of his career, um, I think that pace and pressure and wrestling of Gamrot's just, just too much for him, man. Moving down, women's flyweight, Caitlin Seminara, formerly Caitlin Chukagian, taking on Macy Barber. You know, um, Seminara, uh, Chukagian, been a, been a, I was looking at my tapology, or not my tapology, my bet MMA, and got a pretty good history with, uh, with her, man. Cashing on her money lines by decisions. And I think the length that she has on Macy is going to be huge in this fight. I think Barber's really going to struggle to close that distance. She's one of these girls that loads up on shots. She's She likes to be physical. She likes to have the power advantage like she does in most fights. And I think she's just going to be swinging at air. I don't think she has much technique to her game. I feel like gas tank-wise, I, I do favor Caitlin, the output. As far as wrestling goes, I don't think either one of them have very good takedown defense, just truth be told. But um, I, I kind of see maybe Macy Barber – being the more physical of the two and maybe being the one who does land takedowns here. Um, but it's hard for me not to think this fight plays out extremely close. Um, the point spread for uh, Caitlin was plus three and a half at minus 150. So I told you it's like the odds makers are saying that she has a 60% chance of going to a split decision or winning a round unanimously, but she's got less than a 35% chance of winning another round and winning, you know, winning the fight. Like, I just feel like, I feel like that point spread shows me that the money line could be a little bit wide, but then I see the media day stuff This, you know, and I don't want to harp on it too much. Um, and it's honestly makes me really sad. You know, you know, I've just had a baby a couple months ago and stuff. So it's like that, that sucks, man. Um, and I don't think her head's in the right spot. And that kind of has talked me off betting uh, UK again this week. So I'm going to go Macy Barber by decision, man. Yeah. Uh, mindset coming into the fight, you know, half of the game, man, really right. is. You, know, you hear the retirement talks uh, from some people. Then you hear you hear this story from Caitlin. And uh, it's, it's certainly something that I feel like should be um, taken into consideration when making a bet on anybody. Um, and I have to agree with all those points. Macy Barber um, – I think that, I think that again, she's just at a different point in her career. She isn't necessarily who I think that a lot of people thought that she was, but I do think that she's a serviceable fighter. And um, if she sticks to a game plan, I could see this being a, a close women's decision. I like the plus three and a half on Caitlin if she was in. Um, if we knew that she was going to come in, in normal yeah. form, but you know, given the circumstances, it's it's tough to gauge. This is probably a layoff fight for me. I do expect Macy Barber to get this done just by edging it out. 
Uh, moving on to the prelim main event, uh, one of my favorite fights on the card, man. It's it's a heavyweight matchup between Curtis Blades and Jelton Almeida. Dude, this is one of those ones where I think you play this out a hundred times and Curtis wins a lot of those times, man. You know, there's so many different ways this fight could go. And I feel like Curtis has the advantage in a lot of different aspects of MMA. It's just whether or not, you know, this one time is going to happen. Jelton Almeida, it seems like he's, he's unbeatable. Um, we just saw him control somebody in Derek Lewis for 25 minutes, which, you know, was one of the most boring fights ever, but, um, it also, he did what a lot of people could not do, you know, and right. controlling Derek Lewis for 25 minutes is actually a, a victory in and of itself. Um, I don't know, dude. I, I think that he has the athleticism to get this fight on the mat. Curtis Blades, not somebody who usually has to face offensive wrestling whenever he's fighting. He's usually the one shooting the takedowns. And um, I have seen uh, evidence of people you know, wrapping up his legs and being able to take Curtis Blades down. Um, and I feel like as a wrestler, him being on his back, he kind of goes into panic mode and that could fall right into Jelton Almeida's game plan. Um, but if this fight doesn't get to the mat, man, like I think Curtis Blades has, if this was a kickboxing match, Curtis Blades would be a minus 500, you know, like I, I really do think that he has all the tools on the feet to, to really kind of expose Jelton Almeida, um, but <laughs> you know, I don't know what's going to happen this one time right here, and I'm not sure I want to bet um, Curtis Blades at at, at Pickham's here. Um, yeah, dude, I think that this is a layoff fight, and just going to enjoy it as a fan. To be honest with you, I think Pickham's is probably right. I don't really know how to read this fight. I think Curtis Blades is a better MMA fighter, but I just don't think that he's going to win this fight. For whatever reason, yeah, I uh, I have Curtis Blades in our little fantasy league thing that we're in. Um, I was a lot more excited about it prior to running tape on this. Just truth be told, I um I think this might be the true like first disagreement, man. I'm 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 tempted to bet Jolton Almeida here. I um I I know who I can trust more to implement their game plan. I I know Jolton Almeida is going to shoot and striking is not Curtis Blades' game, you know, like he's a wrestler. And so he's not a guy who's out here going and getting a ton of finishes on the feet. So like, I'm just not sold that if, even if it does play out on the feet that Curtis Blades is just a massive favorite, you know, he's been KO'd four times in his career. And I feel like Jolton Almeida has a speed advantage, throws that nasty front kick. But um, that's it, right? That's where it ends. Oh. That's where it ends on the feet, but I, what I think is that Jolton Almeida shooting a takedown immediately, and I think he's going to get Curtis Blades to the mat, and I think the wrestling tendency to give up your back is going to be a glaring hole. Um, I think when, like when these guys hit the mat, Curtis Blades does not have near the control that Jolton Almeida does on the mat. He does not have near the back take ability, near the submission ability. <laughs> I don't know, man. I really, like, pre-fight, I wanted to bet Curtis Blades. I kind of think Jalton Almeida might submit him in round one, just truth be told, man. Um, I just have a gut feeling that, that Jalton Almeida is the side on Saturday. But I, I don't know if I – I've kind of lost – I think I don't know how much plus money is still sitting out there. I know it was I know it was just a little bit like plus 105, plus 110 to start the week. But I think it's virtually a pick em right now. And just losing that plus money bite me enough to kind of, like you said, just kind of want to sit back and enjoy it and – see how he does against his first real test in the division. Yeah, it's minus 115 across the board for Jelton. I think more people are are seeing the same stuff that we are and kind of see that Curtis might be a little exposed. Um, I did invest in a Jelton Almeida PSA 10 Black Velocity right here. Uh, so I am personally rooting for him, <laughs> but I, I uh, don't know, man. I'm excited to, like I, like we said, just watch this as a fan. It's a, it's a gift. I need it's to go – I need to go bust out the card for the main event then, don't Ooh, I? Absolutely, dude. You actually know, should. Uh, moving on to the main card, man. One of the best fights on the card in my eyes. We have Piotr Jan taking on Song Yadong. I said, give me this give me this fight and give me this line prior to the Marab fight, and it probably would have been a three-unit play for me on Piotr Jan, just truth be told. And I know Song Yadong and Marab don't have the same style at all, but – 
I did not like the sight of Piotr Jan getting completely dominated, man, from pillar to post, 50-45. It was just a bad look because in my eyes, I don't know, man, I thought he was – I thought he was the best bantamweight in the world on his best night, and he did not look anywhere close to that against Marab Mine. Um, now he's kind of taken the time off, which could be good um, to kind of reset. I think he's lost three in a row now. Um, but I really do like his game, his pressure, his boxing, his cardio, his trips in the clinch, the body work. He really wears on guys and breaks them. He's very technical, and there is a there's a lot to like about Piotr Jan. I'm I'm very tempted to buy the dip here because I was looking at my bet MMA, and I've bet this guy in his last five fights against better competition than Song Yudong at worse numbers than I am getting against Song Yudong. But you know, a lot of I hear a lot of people saying, "Oh, you know, this is Piotr Jan's fight to get back on track." I think the UFC is doing Song Yudong a favor. Truth be told, man, I think you know. Pedro Munoz is on this card. We could have we could have let Piotr Jan fight a Pedro Munoz or somebody. No, it's 26-year-old Song Yudong, who's won four of his last five fights, who was two to two going into the fifth with Corey Sanhagen. Man, I I think Song Le- Song Yudong is legit, um, and I think they're honestly I think the UFC is happy with whatever happens here. You know, they, they got a massive Chinese superstar that could take advantage for a big spot opening up the pay per view. And that's kind of keeping me off the Peter Yon side, man. I, I want to see him get back on track. Um, I don't want to force anything, but I, I'm going to pick Peter Yon by decision. And it, it's kind of, it's hard for me to lay off. Um, like I said, betting him at, at worse numbers against better competition and seeing minus 120. It's taken some discipline to lay off Peter Yon this week. Um, so I also have a history with Piotr Jan. He's probably lost me more money than anybody on this card. You know, I, I bet him against Aljo Sterling. I bet him against Sean O'Malley. Um, I don't know, man. I'm kind of, kind of over betting him, dude. He, he's one of these yeah. guys who, uh, needs a round or two to download information before he gets started. And yet another reason why not to bet him here. Song Yudong fucking starts hard and heavy every single time. And this is only a three-round fight. Piotr Jan does not have the luxury of being able to sit back and download the game plan of Song Yudong. And while he's doing that, Song's going to be landing the bigger shots in the round. And uh, I <clears throat> I expect him to, to win this fight. Um, get the nod on the judges' scorecards. The UFC wants him to win. Um, Piotr Jan's just going to be one of those, you know, what could have happened, what what should have been type fighters, um, because this is not a favorable matchup, in my opinion, especially in a three-round fight where Song's going to be able to throw 100% power the entire 15 minutes. Um, yeah, without the threat of five rounds, he's he's got the, the green light to throw everything in his shots and continue that pace for 15 minutes. So um, this is probably a Song Yudong or pass. I expect Song to get the nod on the judges scorecards. Um, although this is another situation where I feel like Piotr Jan's the better MMA fighter. If this was a 10 round fight, I'd be betting Piotr Jan, but it's not, you know, with mm-hmm. 15 minutes to work with. And I think Yudong will use that, that time a little bit um, more efficiently. So moving on to the, Welterweight division, Gilbert Tarino Burns taking on Jack Della Maddalena. Um, this is an exciting fight, man. I feel like I've constantly been looking for the opportunity to fade Jack Della Maddalena. Um, thought we were going to get the opportunity with Sean Brady. That fight fell through. Now we get it here with Gilbert Burns, who I think could implement a similar game plan to Sean Brady. Not as good a wrestling, which is a little... Um, concerning but i do think that if the fight ends up on the mat he's going to have such a significant jiu-jitsu advantage jack della likes to give up uh, an arm triangle and gilbert burns has a stupid squeeze dude yeah i got gilbert burns in my fan on my fantasy draft and so i'm trying to fight with myself on whether or not there's bias with that if i actually think he's gonna win um i do think that this is a pretty decent spot to um to fade Jack Della, you know, you're not even you're not even going to kick yourself because you're getting plus money on Gilbert Burns, you know? You're not having to pay juice to fade Jack Della here. I do feel like the hype is a little undeserved. 
Gilbert Burns is one of these guys where he fights up to his competition. You're not going to get him on a bad day. Uh, we've seen him in there with Kamzat Chemaev, and I think Chemaev offers a lot of different problems, a lot more problems than Jack Della Maddalena does here. Give me Gilbert Burns. I like the plus money. Don't know how I'm going to play it, but I love I love Gilbert here. It, I think that's where the value currently lies as well, where where the number is swelled to. But I I still think Jack Della Maddalena is going to get the job done. Um, as far as the fight goes, I think it's basically as binary as we're ever going to see a fight. Um, grappler versus striker. I feel like it's a burn sub or it's a, a Jack Della knockout. Um, and in hindsight, I think the winner is going to look like a big favorite here. This fight to me is really determined by what Burns, show, which Gilbert Burns is going to show up. Is it the one from the Magni and the Wonder Boy fight where he is shooting takedowns instantly in round one, where he's shooting doubles covering meters, dude? You know, um, this price could be a gift, like you talked about. There is a clear jujitsu um, edge here. Um, the Hafez fight ends with a, a arm triangle in round one. You go back to the Contender Series and see Angelusa get him um, also in an arm triangle. But JDM's boxing is just top-notch, man. Easily top five in the UFC. Some of the smoothest hands I've seen. I, I love watching his combinations. And so while I see I see there are areas that Gilbert Burns could take advantages of um, that Jack struggles with, I think it could kind of be the same for the other side. You see the hooker finish um, where, where Gilbert gets his hands dropped with the body work. Jack loves to lead with body work. You see um, uh, in the Hamzat and the Usman fight, Gilbert Burns has dropped with a jab. <laughs> Nobody works behind that jab better than Jack Dilly, you know? So I, I think I think I see both guys having clear paths to victories, and I'm hoping that the under two and a half, that minus 150 is not a trap, dude, because it almost feels like too good of a play sitting at 60%. But I was comfortable saying that I think this fight finishes, you know, two out of every three times, six out of 10. I think it finishes at probably about 66%. So I was happy to, to just get on the under here. I think that's the best way to look at this fight. But if you want my pick, I sadly think Jack Dell is going to knock him out in the first round, man. First round. Yeah, sadly. But, uh, you know, at the same time, where the line is swelled to, I think Gilbert Burns is the value side money line-wise, man, 100%. 100%. You know, Kevin Holland and Michael Page, man, at 170. I'm not as excited for this fight, I guess, just truth be told. Um, I don't know what it is, man. I, and, and I have a tough time getting a clear read on it as well. I think I'm going to be on the MVP side, man, and that's not the side that I thought I would be on prior to just looking at this fight. You know, um, you, know you got a 37-year-old kickboxer coming over, and Kevin Holland, who's the company man, can maybe mix it up more. And so, I, truth be told, I thought Kevin Holland would be the side here. But going back and watching this tape, I don't, I can't trust him to wrestle. And even when he does, it's not like his wrestling is all that good. You know, he's hurting people with the right hand and locking up chokes with a lot of his finishes. It's not like, it's not like he's out here spamming doubles and singles and things. Um, I think he struggles with guys who are very technical. The Wonder Boy, the Jack Della fight. I mean, Wonder Boy is piecing him up. Jack Della was like. Jack Della kicked him in the butt, man, a couple times because he was spinning him around with his shots. Like, he he got out of position, and he looked like he was really struggling, like I said, with good strikers. I think the leg kicks um, of MVP are going to be crucial here. And just as far as fight IQ-wise, it's it's really hard to trust Kevin Holland at juice, man. Um, he's long. He's rangy. I do like his right hand. I like his front choke series. Um, and he does have the youthful the youthfulness in this fight. I just I don't know, man. My my gut tells me that MVP is, is going to get a decision here off of using the bigger cage, landing leg kicks, body kicks, bouncing in and out. I don't think it's going to be that exciting of a fight, and that could be why I'm just not just don't care about it too much, man. I like MVP to win a pretty boring decision, truth be told. Man, so you know, part of me wants to max bet Holland here. And the other part of me cannot forget him getting up off Wonder Boy in the third, second, third round, whichever round he took him down yeah, just in. Him up. <laughs> Shook his hand. Like, like you said, it's just like 
you know, it's like betting uh, Randy Brown at juice. Like you, you know, you're doing it to yourself. If you want to do that, be my <laughs> guest, but he's going to make you regret it halfway through the fight, win or lose, you know? And I do feel like that's kind of what you get when you bet Kevin Holland. Um, as the line continues to come down, this is another one where I think, you know, it's funny. <laughs> the two fights that I've said that the, you know, Curtis Blades is the better MMA fighter. Or Peter Yan is the better MMA fighter. I've picked Jelton Almeida and Song Yadong. I feel like I'm I'm almost, you know, going the opposite here. I think I have to play Kevin Holland here. Michael Venom Page in his current form, um, I think he's aging. Obviously, whenever you get up there in age, the stuff that Michael Page relied on his entire career being fast and agile and all that, that's what's going to, you know, the, the reaction time, that's what's going to fade first. And Kevin Holland's one of these guys where he might be dumb enough to stand and trade with him, but he's also awkward enough to to really catch somebody like Michael Venom Page. And if it does wind up on the mat, I think he's got a clear advantage there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll probably find a bet on Kevin Holland. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of his, though, as well. So that, that might be clouding my judgment just a little bit, but um, at almost evens um, where they're at in their career. And then I got to ask myself, like, why did the UFC bring MVP? Was it just to make these matchups? Do they want to see him succeed? He was a longtime Bellator stay. I mean, where does, where does Dana sit on this? Does he, you know, would he want to see him just come in and be like, yeah, he was never UFC caliber to begin with. Um, I don't know. I don't really know how to read this fight as far as the, the narrative playing out, but um, signing somebody like MVP at 38 or whatever, it seems like an odd move. Uh, I think I'm going Kevin Holland here. I think he's the better MMA fighter. So minus 125 too. I, I, I do like that spot. There's no way I'm getting off of that. Uh, moving on to the co-main event, Dustin Poirier versus Benoit Saint-Denis. Um, right as soon as this podcast started, we both let out a play on Dustin Poirier. Um Dude, I think that this line's blown out of proportion, dude. You know, I was I was on Benoit Saint Denis against uh, Bon Fim at plus two seventy five, and it was a great number. Um, but you know, a couple of uh, I'm blanking on his last win. Yeah, a couple of meaningless wins later, and he's a fucking minus two ten over Dustin Poirier. Matt Frivola is not a good test to test, or like, not a good. Uh, gauge of how he's going to perform against Dustin Poirier, man. Dustin Poirier is on a completely different level than any of the guys that, that Benoit saint has beaten in the UFC. Um, truth be told, I think that Dustin Poirier's experience and um, well-rounded game should give him a clear advantage here. It sucks that he's coming off the head kick knockout to Gaethje. You don't really know how he's going to bounce back from that. Um, and if this fight does go down to who's got more dog in them, historically, Dustin Poirier is the guy you want to back in that. But um, he's sitting on a lot of money right now, man. And uh, BSD, Special Forces in France, he's – He's Killed got a dog, dog in him, dog. dude. Yeah, the, the fight against uh, Liza Zaleski dos Santos is disgusting, honestly. Like, yeah. it should have been stopped a hundred times before um, before it did. And I, I don't know, dude. I, I, uh, I've got to go Poirier here. It's just one of those fights where Poirier is an excellent fighter to be getting at plus money against anybody. If I sat here and did not play Dustin Poirier at plus 190, against any lightweight on the planet, I think I'd be kicking myself, dude. He's proven time and time again he's on that level, and BSD is yet to prove that. So Dustin yeah. Poirier all day. Let's give him one more time. That's what I texted you the other day, wasn't it? It's like, is he really this big of a dog to anybody in the lightweight division? And you responded, only Islam. You know, like, mm -hmm. come on now. Like, plus 190, um, like, you, you got to take the chance, man. I said it could be the trap line of the year or it could be the best line of the year. And and like you said, we got to find out, man. Um, I was watching some embedded or some UFC countdown, something, man. And a John Anik quote came on that said, when the bullets are flying, give me Dustin Poirier every single day. And it 
he's right, man. This guy is this guy has been a part, has been responsible for some of the best fights in UFC history. This guy is a dog. You know, he's he will not quit on himself unless you, you know, unless you finish him. I love his boxing combinations. He's a right-handed southpaw, so he carries power in that lead hand, which is very, very different from a lot of guys. Five round experience. I think his cardio, he always shows up in incredible shape, can take a shot. Um, and in 38 pro fights, this guy's never lost two fights in a row as well. Um, the only thing that you can question is where his head is, where the motivation is, coming off a knockout loss, the Connor money. You know, he was really one of these guys that said he didn't really want to take the step down in competition and fight these contenders, and, and here he is doing so. Um, so that's, that's my only question is how motivated is Dustin Poirier going to be on Saturday? Um, but if it's the Dustin Poirier that I know that shows up and fights – Plus 190 is going to probably be a gift, man. Um, I don't have to question the motivation and the heart of BSD. Like you said, he is also an absolute dog, man. Um, the upside I think he has in this fight is in the grappling. You know, I I do think he could land takedowns on Dustin Poirier, but I'm also – I'm also a little bit higher on Benoit St. Denis jiu-jitsu than I am his wrestling. When he got to Bonfin's back, the body triangle, the rear naked choke setup was nice. The Matt Frivola, the Tiago Moises sweeps from Butterfly Guard, nice. But as far as his pure wrestling, I'm, I'm not that sold on it, truth be told. I don't think it's on the level of somebody like Habib or anybody like that that's been taken. I don't even know if it's on the level of Michael Chandler, truth be told, man. Um, and I, I think BSD is very poor defensively. I think he's going to be there to be hit. I think he's comfortable walking through fire. Um, and, and Dustin Poirier can tag you, man. Um, another talking point that I've not seen anybody talk about yet. I see nothing but praise for the Benoit St. Denis body kick. And I, I love it, man. Um, in the Matt Frivola fight, Matt circles off to the cage the first time to the right. It's a body kick. The next time Matt Frivola gets put on the cage and circles out to the right, it's a head kick. Man, he sets it up phenomenally, and that's one of my favorite strikes coming from a southpaw. Dustin Poirier is also the first southpaw of Benoit St. Denis' fault in the UFC. That same southpaw advantage that he has with a body kick that he sets a lot of his shots up with are not going to be there, man. So the more we talk about it, I was very glad to see you come in here and talk to me about Dustin Poirier as well because I think the value is, is just too hard to pass up at plus 190. So – Glad to have you on that side. Let's ride with him one more time, man. Uh, and last but not least, move on to the main event of the evening, a rematch for the Bantamweight strap. we got Sugar Sean O'Malley taking on Marlon Chito Vera. You know, Sean O'Malley gets a lot of hate um, for kind of being, I don't know, maybe uh, gifted his way on up, uh, won some fights he shouldn't have. I don't think Sean O'Malley is a bad fighter, man, just just truth be told. Um, I did have a little bit on him at plus 200 against Aljamain Sterling. I think he's a very, very good striker, man. I, I think he uses his height and his distance, um, his counters and footwork very well. And if you're just going to stand with Sean O'Malley, it's a hard fight, man, to win. Um, his fainting game is probably the best part about his game. He is always, you know, fainting, making you think something's going to come. And when you watch the Sandhagen fight versus Marlon Vera, and he was he was frozen by the striking of Corey Sandhagen. You know, straight up 50-45. Um, doesn't look like he should have even belonged at the top of the division. Uh, and that kind of does worry me um, that O'Malley, you know, is just too clean for him on the feet. Um, I don't know if – I don't think he would finish him because Cheeto's as durable as could be. But I, I, I wouldn't count out a spot where Sean O'Malley runs away with a pretty clear decision here. Um, or is up heavily on the scorecards going into the championship rounds. But I think that's where things start to get pretty interesting, man. I think Cheeto Vera lives for five-round fights where he can kind of download his information like you talked about. If if Cheeto sees you slip up one time, if he even catches the uh, uh, get you know the win that you're that you're slowing down, man, he's gonna pick it up and he's gonna put it on you. Cheeto's mean. Cheeto is very crafty. Cheeto's finishing instincts like none other, truth be told, man. Some of the front kicks, the the head kick of Dominic Cruz, um, he's a very potent finisher, man. And if I'm playing the O'Malley money line, I think things could get a little bit sketchy come rounds four and five and maybe even a little bit prior to that. I think O'Malley's path to victory here is by decision and laying close to three to one on that. Hmm. 
that's just something I can't do, man. Uh, I know you and I have a little bit of play on Marlon Chito Vera finish only at plus 132, and that's just quite crazy to me, to be honest with you, man. Marlon never been finished in over 30 fights. I feel like he has all of the finishing upside here. So I was extremely happy to get that line. And I kind of hope he wins on Saturday, just truth be told. I don't know what it is about it. Um, but I kind of hope Cheeto wins. Maybe because Sean sucks. <laughs> he kind of does, man, like you're right. Um, but I think Cheeto Vera is just as marketable. You know, it's like people are talking about the fights in Miami and stuff for O'Malley, like, there's a ton of Hispanic population in Miami going to be cheering for Cheeto Vera. I saw Cheeto Vera showed up today and did a whole entire media day in English and then a whole entire media day in Spanish with over 40, 40 journalists that flew in from Ecuador for this guy, man. Um, That's cool. You know, like I, I think I think the UFC is just as happy if this guy wins as well. So all the finishing upside on the dog is very tempting to me, man. Um to, to take the money line shot. Uh, but I think you and I kind of have the best the best bet on this whole entire fight at the the finish only for Cheeto. I think Sean O'Malley gets his hand raised by decision. Sucks to say, but that's what I think happens. Um, hmm. So another one I'm coming in with a little bit of bias. Monvera <laughs> in the fantasy league. And uh, I do think that he gets it done, man. Like I'm happy that we have him. Uh, scorecards, no action, because you're right. He's, he's so much more durable than Sean, in my opinion. Um, I know it was kind of like a fluky loss, their first fi- their first match with Sean's leg giving out. But, um, you know, I, even M- Marlon doesn't really take the chances that I think Sean thrives on early. Uh, Marlon takes a lot of time to download information. This being a five-round fight, I think that that, you know, is a benefit to him. Sean, although we've seen him like really pull the dog out in his fight with Piotr Jan, um, we're still talking about a, um, a three round fight. You know, we haven't really seen Sean. Yeah. We we haven't seen him go championship rounds where Marlon Vera's game up until this point, all directions point to that being a benefit to him. Yeah. Um, So, I don't know, dude. I, if we can all agree that Sean probably doesn't finish Marlon Vera, who's never been finished, um, then that means that, you know, you're just as likely. I, I feel like you, there's so many more unknowns on the O'Malley side playing minus 300 when he's never seen 10 minutes of a fight that we're all expecting it to get to. Like, mm-hmm. that's fucking crazy, you know? Right. I, I, I feel like the the obvious play is Marlon Vera here at plus 240 or us getting plus money on the scorecards, no action. Yeah. Um, yeah, dude, that's, that's all, that's all I really got for it. it. It's, it's kind of a crazy line to me. I might end up playing just Marlon Vera straight for a unit talking myself into it. Um, but it just, you know, Sean O'Malley, I feel like is, although it's earned and I understand that it was a close fight, but I, I don't know. I'm okay with either guy winning that fight in the Piotr Jan fight. Um, he earned it by defending his title against Elijah Main Sterling, um, but he still hasn't proven enough, in my opinion. I've got to see five round a championship five rounds for me to really feel confident in somebody who's defending the belt, and we haven't seen that yet. Maybe this is a perfect fight for him to prove it, but I do think that Marlon Vera is really going to push the pace in those final few rounds, and uh, you know that's where I could see him taking over this fight. Give me Marlon Vera at plus 240, probably climbs. I think as the week continues, there's so many people that I know that are going to be throwing Sean O'Malley in their parlays. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll probably see Marlon Vera plus 280 come fight time, and uh, I think that that's a perfectly fine line to play him. 100%, man, as the line is swelled. Um, although I see the O'Malley decision being the most likely outcome, it's kind of like the Burns fight, man, where the line is swelled to values on the underdog, just like the Poirier fight where it's swelled to a couple underdogs on the pay-per-view that might come through, man. Not typical of pay-per-view cards. We got 14 total fights on Saturday. A lot of meat on the bone for this, 299. I was thinking about it the other day. Um, you know, we got UFC 300 that's coming up. So everybody was like, why would you stack 299? Francis Ngannou is fighting this weekend. That's why Dana did this. 
overshadowed Francis a little bit, man. Uh, I'm super pumped for UFC 299, man. It's loaded with killer fights. Uh, hoping for both of us to be able to get back on track, make some of those units back, and we'll see you guys next week. Peace.